how did medieval knights swing swords and maces? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now I'll try and keep this concise, but this might seem like a really simple question. How do you swing a thing? Well, quite simply, you pick it up and you swing it, don't you? Well, actually, if we look at the treatises and guidance of the time, particularly when we come to swords, because that's what we've got the most uh, treatises concerning, actually it's not as simple as that. So there's a couple of things to bear in mind here. First of all, in terms of how to give a strike, so if we're looking at unarmoured martial arts, um, in the German world known as Blossvechten, uh, or shirt fencing, essentially, the main consideration is protection of the hand quite, quite a lot of the time in terms of how you swing. So regardless of uh, where you're starting from, what your starting position is in terms of where the actual sword starts, it could even be out in front of you, one of the things you've got to be concerned about all of the time is about the opponent counter hitting you in the hand while you make a cut. Because of course this is the most, certainly in an unarmoured context, this is the most um, vulnerable part of you because it's closest to the opponent and even if you've got a leather glove on, one, one little hit from the opponent's sword in your hand means that you're essentially not able to fight properly anymore, okay? You might be completely disabled, you might be disarmed um, and so on and so forth. So. Um, if, for example, the sword is starting out in front of us in a guard position, which it isn't a lot in, in medieval systems, then if we make what's the equivalent um, in Sabre called a moulinet, that is a circular motion to give a cut, we want it to be quite direct. If we're starting in a more medievalish guard, uh, for example, up here next to the head, uh, which in some systems might be uh, Poste di Donna la Destraza, or might be um, Vom Tag, or various, or Guardia di Alta, so if it's here or up here, then it's a direct motion here. Now, that seems pretty simple, yeah? But a really important uh, error to highlight that uh, beginners make when they're doing unarmored fencing is they lead with the hand and then whip the blade through. Why do they do this? Because it's powerful, okay? If we're chopping wood, if you watch people chopping wood, then very often they'll swing the axe with the hands and then the axe blade will swing through afterwards because in terms of pure body mechanics, a bit like swinging a, a baseball bat, this is powerful. However, if you've got someone standing in front of you who's trying to kill you or disable you, then leading with the hands, if you just think about this in distance, if I show from the side, if I'm starting here, if I lead with the hand into here before then swinging the blade through, yes, the blade is powerful, but the problem is, bam, at that point I'm getting hit in the hand before then either hitting the opponent or not hitting the opponent, as the case may be. So leading with the hand with a weapon that has very little hand protection. Also, look at where the hand guard is. When the hand guard is in front of my hand, it protects the hand fairly well. If I'm leading like this with the pommel, then the hand guard doesn't protect at all. I may as well be holding a stick with no hand guard, okay? So leading through with the hand and striking like this and then whipping the blade through might be very powerful, but it means that you may never get to hit at all because you'll just be hit in the hand and disabled, okay? So the way that we often strike with swords is actually leading with the blade first. So if I'm going here, it's casting that point out as quickly as possible so that there's the minimum risk to my hand in giving the blow. And it's still a reasonably powerful blow. It may not be the most powerful blow, but it's still a reasonably powerful blow which doesn't leave my hand vulnerable and therefore is more likely to hit the opponent and more likely to have the effect. The overall end result that I'm looking for. Now, how does this change if we switch over to a mace, for example? And you could apply this to an ax or a warhammer because this is a top heavy weapon, okay? And weapons like maces, warhammers, not flails, that's a different situation, although you could say they are also top heavy. They balance near the end rather than near the hand. The sword balances near the hand, the mace or axe or warhammer balances near the tip. However, in an unarmored context, the theory is still the same. Yes, I could step in and wham, you know, step through with all of my body, twist my, put my foot in, put my hips in, put my shoulder in, put my arm in before I swing through with the head. But the problem is in an unarmored context, I'm likely to get my hand chopped off or my arm chopped off. Um, it's also relatively easy to parry as well because you're doing all of this motion showing that you're committed to a thing 
before the weapon gets there. So it gives your opponent longer to prepare to defend from it. So even with the mace in an unarmoured context, you'll notice I'm wearing a helmet, so I will get to armoured in a second. In an unarmoured context, um, it's still better as much as possible to throw that tip out as quickly as you can if you do it towards the camera. So although I am stepping through and I am bringing the right hand side of my body through, that head is coming out fast enough that it's hitting the opponent, or at least the opponent's got to deal with it, hopefully, uh, before having a chance to just counter to my hand or arm. Okay? Now, here's the elephant in the room. Maces were not often used in an unarmoured situation. They were usually used in armour. So if I throw a gauntlet on, okay, so here's one of my gauntlets. I throw on my right hand gauntlet. If I put this on, now I can actually lead with the hand because the opponent countering to my hand is irrelevant to me because it's covered in hardened steel plate, okay? So in that situation, in an armoured context, completely different and the body mechanics might might be almost the opposite because in that situation I just want to hit the opponent as hard as I possibly can do in which case it might be advantageous for me to actually commit everything in wham and then swim swing through with the um, with the mace head because I'm purely trying to hit them as hard as possible with the bludgeoning instrument to have some effect with the armor moreover them countering to my arm or hand, assuming I've got full plate, not just a gauntlet. Um, so all of my arms are encased in steel plate, I'm encased in steel plate, I'm completely down and ready and fully plated. Then in that situation, they can't just, I mean, they could counter just to my hand, but it's not gonna do anything. It might stop, that's the only thing you could say, is they could just put the weapon in the way and block into my arm. So they could counter to here and it might stop the blow having an effect, but they're not gonna wound me, they're not gonna injure me through hardened steel plate, okay? Because that's what it's designed to do. Even with the sharp sword, it's not gonna go through plate armor. So, you might choose different body mechanics for that. Um, however, if we rewind a bit now and have a look at the, uh, the flexation of the arm, okay? So you've essentially got, you've got four points at which you manipulate and give motion to an object. The first one is, the fingers, okay? And this is accentuated a lot, for example, in foil fencing. And even with minimal movement from the wrist, I can move this weapon around purely with the movement of my finger and thumb, fingers and thumb, okay? Next one is the wrist. Clearly, I can move a weapon around just from the wrist without moving the rest of my arm uh, notably, okay? So I can give momentum, I can give energy to this weapon just from my fingers and wrist, and this is often what we do in saber fencing, and it's also what you do the majority of the time in small sword or foil as well. Okay, so the wrist and the fingers are very important, particularly with lighter types of swords, sword that balance close to the hand. However, you've also, of course, got an elbow, okay? And some saber systems put a lot more emphasis on using the elbow to cut with, and some systems, some sort of systems, use what we call a stiff wrist. That is, they kind of lock the wrist in and they actually give the motion from, predominantly from the elbow, which is a more powerful blow, but a little bit more predictable, easier to see, and possibly a little bit easier to counter, certainly from a, a British or French sabre fencing perspective. And of course, you've got the shoulder. Now, we could also add the rest of the body into this. You've got the turning of the body, you've got the hips, you've got the feet, you've got the shoulders. But let's just limit it to the arm for now. So fundamentally, you've got the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and the fingers. Now, with a weapon like a mace, you could give a blow with any one of those or any combination of those. Um, however, <laughs> with medieval systems, whether it's with a mace or a sword, we tend to see um, a combination of the whole arm. So if, for example, we're starting in a position known as Guardi di Alta or Vom Tag or um, Posta di Donna, then we tend to see a combination of the wrist, the elbow and the um, shoulder and to some degree the fingers as well. Okay, so we'll do a passing step in. I'm, I've got a cable here, so I'm having to be a bit careful how I step. Um, but a passing step in that will involve all three of those things. And it might swing through and come again from another side and you'll be using all of those articulations. So, what we could say is, in terms of if we come back to leading with the tip of the weapon or leading with the hand and whipping through with the tip of the weapon, there is another issue besides these articulations. And what you might think you want to do, 
uh, with a mace. So if you look at this motion, I, I can get quite a lot of uh, extension and motion in the mace just from the wrist. But there's a reason, <laughs> another reason, why that's probably not historically correct and probably wasn't done with maces most of the time, certainly in armour, and that is these. So remember that these are part and parcel of this and also dictate whether you want to lead with the hand or lead with the tip. You only have a certain amount of rotation with a gauntlet. Now some people will say, oh well my gauntlets allow more rotation than yours. Yes this is true, however these are a kind of middle ground, okay, and of all the historical gauntlets I've looked at, originals, some of them have less mobility in the wrist than these do. These are kind of in the middle. Certain types of hourglass gauntlets from the 14th century have a lot of rotation in the wrist. That might be because they were still cutting more with swords and stuff in the 14th century and this gradually declined and favoured two-handed weapons and half-swording in the 15th century. That's completely conjecture. Um, but if we look at 15th century gauntlets, they actually often, well, they pretty much always restrict the wrist to some degree, to greater or lesser extent. So, with the mace or the sword, whilst I'm now in armour, I'm safe enough to lead with the hand and whip through with the weapon, I can't extend in the same way that's the maximum extension I can get with my gauntlets, that angle there, okay? You'll notice if I take the gauntlet off, I can now get that extension. I can get basically in a straight line with the arm, as we would do in sabre. But you can't do that with basically any gauntlets. Even the most flexible gauntlets that you find um, don't allow as much extension as you would have without those gauntlets on. And if we look at modern Bohurt fighting, for example, um, Battle of the Nations, HMB, that kind of stuff, their gauntlets often have unhistorical wrist articulations because the people doing that at modern activity want a greater amount of wrist rotation than period gauntlets will allow them. Um, so they've literally invented new types of articulation for the wrist, which there's almost no evidence for on um, historical gauntlets. And certainly the majority of historical gauntlets are far more restrictive than modern Bohurt gauntlets are. So the question is, why were they more restrictive? Well, clearly, because they weren't striking in a way that required them to have that degree of movement. And I would argue, therefore, that they were using the arm more than the wrist. So they were essentially using a stiff wrist um, system. Um, and probably they were leading with the hand some of the time, but there's, you can only get a certain amount of tip speed in if you're not extending out to a full extension. So indeed, you might have motions that are a sort of wrap type motion with a mace, but with a sword, that's pretty much irrelevant. So if they, and bear in mind, they might not have been doing an awful lot of striking by this point with swords, but if they were doing striking with swords, um, then indeed, they must have been with these types of gauntlets. Whilst you've got some wrist, road, um, some wrist extension involved here, there's not a huge amount, nowhere near what you'd have without the gauntlets on. So they must have been using their elbows and their shoulders more. Anyway, um, I hope that's a sort of, um, get some interest, I suppose, in the subject. But generally speaking, I would say, how you want to strike with a sword or a mace very much depends on, are you in armour or are you not in armour? Now, this question was all about knights. So in armour, I would say how you want to strike with a mace is print to answer the question, which some people complain that I don't do. To answer the question, you want to principally giving, be giving the force from the elbow and the shoulder motion, okay, with a relatively stiff wrist and, contrary to Blosfecton or unarmoured fighting, often leading with the hand and whipping through with the blade to give maximum force because wearing armour enables you to do that safely, okay? So currently, my current theory would be, if someone said, how do I strike with a mace in armour? It would be, put your body in, step, twist your hips, throw your shoulder in, give most of the force in terms of your arm, and most of the motion, shall we say, coming from the elbow and the shoulder, and uh, you can lead with the hand and whip through with the, with the weapon. You don't have to lead with the weapon's tip because you're wearing armour. And I would say, therefore, that a sword is somewhat similar, although you might find because it doesn't have so much percussive force but it is quicker, you might be wanting to lead with the blade slightly more with the hand, but you can lead with the hand and whip through the blade because you've got the ability to do so because you've got gauntlets that protect your hands. I hope that's been a little bit interesting and thought-provoking. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts and theories and experiences maybe if you do reenactment or bow hurt or um, even um, harness-effect and armoured um, hema fighting. 
in the comments down below. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, share this video around. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. Give us a like. It means a lot to me and uh, helps the algorithm. And I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.